So welcome everybody. I think we're going to kick off now. Um, I'm just delighted to have everybody here and thank you Alice especially for coming to our Women in Nature and Wildlife. Brockwell Park Community Green has a Zoom conversation about Rootbound, her wonderful book. Um, in case you don't already know, Alice is features editor at Penguin Books, having previously worked as a writer and editor on the arts desk of the Telegraph. After starting to teach herself to garden in 2014, Alice began to share her adventures in urban gardening through naughty culture. That's N-O-U-G-H-T-I culture, which is a newsletter and Instagram account, which is well worth following. Um, she also had a column in the Telegraph. She's since written for Gardener's World and Gardens Illustrated and appeared on Gardener's Question Time. Alice hosts workshop and a YouTube channel for Patch Plants. And her first book, How to Grow Stuff, was published in 2017. Rootbound, the main conversation of our conversation tonight, the main subject of our conversation tonight, was long listed for the Wainwright Prize. If you haven't already root, read Rootbound, I really strongly recommend it, um, hence why we're having this evening. It's a fantastic read. And I hope tonight's conversation <clears throat> will incentivize you to add it to your own Christmas list and to others. The book, part memoir, part historical exploration, part garden writing, is full of personal and gardening insights, horticultural travel, snippets of person, place, person and place biography, and reflections on modern living. Signed copies are available local, locally, local to where I am, <laughs> where the greenhouses are. I realize someone's joining us from Scotland, so not much use to her, I'm afraid. But anyway, they're available at Dulwich Books, 6 Croxted Road. Um, and I think Alice very kindly cycled over there uh, with, with some signed to. copies. She's going to, okay, I'm fine. going to. Well, Depends there you are. How many of you buy one? <laughs> <laughs> well, if that actually, yeah, that's a point. If you, um, if you do, well, I'm sure we can get a dedication situation going on. Let, we, can, we can think about that, but yeah. Okay, yeah. So Good actually that, that takes me on to the, the etiquette for, for Zoom. Um, yeah, normally I do etiquette for live events and always get a bit of a laugh when I tell you you can go and uh, the men can go and wee on the compost, but that's entirely <laughs> irrelevant at this point. Um, I think everybody is already muted, which is marvellous. So um, we'll keep you muted until the questions at the end of Alice and my conversation. But in the meantime, if you want to chat, um, please, please do just um, add chats. I can see Heather's um, at said her sound has stopped working. Can everybody else hear? Okay. Yeah. Okay, fine. Great. But if you want to, um, as I say, put questions up in the course, if things strike you, because when people are talking, you know, things often strike you and you'd like to drop them down on the chat, we can pick those up at the end of the conversation. But obviously anything technical, please, please also do, do put that up. Heather, I hope you're okay now. So if everybody's happy, we'll, we'll um, move forward into, into a bit more of the conversation, which is going to be partly a conversation and partly some readings as well. So we'll sort of segue between the two. Okay, let's go. I'm, I'm, I'm going to enjoy this, I know. Uh, so Rootbound's lovely dedication is to those who put soil and seeds into my hands. This really struck me because I'm so often I so often notice when people visit our community greenhouses that they talk about how their parents or their grandparents or relatives and friends from, from whom they've learned about gardening, they'll chat about what they picked up, what plant reminds them of them. I think sort of gardening is quite like food recipes and it's often handed down through generations and through links of friendship as well. Um, and I thought, Alice, it'd be lovely if you could talk a little bit about those people who put soil and seeds into your hands yeah. and maybe share a few readings. Of course. So the dedication is a, is a funny one. It's very difficult to um, know who to dedicate a book to when you don't, when, you, when that book is about a part of your life that was relatively uh, unstable and um, I didn't want to dedicate it to my parents specifically, I didn't want to dedicate it to my partner, I didn't have any children, these are all kind of the usual suspects to dedicate to. 
And I asked a, a friend of mine who has also written a book, and I was like, how did you, how did you decide upon the dedication? And I can't entirely remember what she said, but it was along the lines of to the people who, who the book wouldn't have existed without. And for me, it was very much the people who helped me garden. And that is all sorts of people. That's people like you, Kate, and people like Kat at the community gardens. That's people like my parents and my grandparents. Um, that's family friends. It's people who have sent me seeds through the post. There's, a, there's an awful lot of people, but you're right that specifically there are really strong family connections. And that's still something that after writing the book fascinates me the way that we pass down as much as gardening is so much about biological journeys uh, through time and science that actually we carry those in ourselves as people with regards to horticulture and how we learn it. And so there are specific people in Rootbound that this explores, namely my parents and my grandparents. And um, I will do some readings. <laughs> my, um, it's a funny one because I don't think anyone in my family was quite expecting them to take the stage that they ended up taking in this book. The writing of it was quite, I kept it quite to myself and, and they kind of just had to read it and find out. Um, and often the way that we learn how to garden happens, if you're lucky, you have a one-on-one -on -one tutorial, but sometimes it happens in quite roundabout and unexpected ways. Um, and I'll, I'll read a section about um, the small ritual that happened in my house over breakfast when I was growing up. Um, which is something that I now carry on in daily practice in my life. My adolescence expanded in a long skinny acre of grass punctuated by a light sapping yew, too old and superstition laden to fell and apparently objectionable oak trees that I always liked. In the mornings, it would be covered by a mist that would creep in over breakfast time, leaving dew and freshness in its wake, forming the backdrop to our kitchen table. My dad's chair sat at the far end of the table. Growing up, the most exciting thing I saw from the window was a pheasant, which I found staring me in the face from two feet away upon opening the curtains shortly after one midwinter dawn. But dad would spend hours looking out, although he frequently only allowed himself minutes, absent-mindedly tapping his wedding ring on the mug and looking at the green beyond. Maybe he was building mental to-do lists. He'd often mutter about the neighbor's eucalyptus or going through the day ahead, granted space by a backdrop that changed in tiny ways with each passing day. No matter how sullen or sleepy I was in those hastily grabbed breakfast minutes before the school bus, dad would offer me the best seat in the house, the one that looked down the garden. He would give up his, say he was done and potter around, stand up and look out the window instead. And I flicking through the paper, staring at the telly, never really noticed that small kindness. Instead, it was something I learned to do without realising. I'd come back from university and warm my thighs on the radiator beneath the window, rest my head on the glass and watch my breath steam up the view of the garden. Um, and yeah, that, that was, I mean, Kate, you very much picked out the, the bits that you wanted us to explore, um, but that is very much about the importance of looking in gardening. And um, my kitchen looks out at my garden now and, and um, and I will, I, it's one of my greatest joys to stand in the kitchen and look out the garden and rest my thighs on the radiator. Um, and every place I've looked, I've lived in, I've always moved the furniture, the, the dining room, the like, dining room is grand, the table in which everything happens, writing, eating, talking, has always faced whatever outdoor space I've had. Um, because it's such a lovely thing to do. And I think that's one of the things you emphasise that gardening is about looking. Um, I think there's a lovely quote, isn't there? Of, of, is it Pete Udolf or the guy he works with? Pete Udolf, yeah, who says that um, if he could, he could, he would give up all gardening tools if if he, as long as he has his eyes. His eyes, the most important tool in gardening, um, which I think is completely true. Massively, looking is so important. Um, and I think if you're a if you're a doer. And I get, you know, it's very, it's very difficult sometimes just to stop and look and, and get a feel for a whole garden. Um, and it's one of the joys, which I think you talk about is walking around with your grandfather and, and yeah. the pleasure you get from walking around with someone else and being able to look and see things that when you're always rushing out to do a job. Yeah. 
it's something that actually is a lot easier to do in other people's gardens than in one's own. But yeah, and, and I've got a few paragraphs on that um, about my grandfather's garden and this kind of or kind of silent ritual that he has passed down the generations of these doing these kind of impromptu tours of gardens. Number 12 Albert Road was built with a greenhouse attached. And even into his late nineties, grandpa would manage to navigate around the piles of empty plant trays and bags of compost, much to the increasing horror of his progeny. Growth from outside and inside would commingle, pushing up against the glass and through the cracks, nature blurring the boundaries of infrastructure, raised to control it. Grandpa gently introduced the habit of an impromptu guided walk around the garden, something that took me time to understand, watching from the house as he and my parents admired the beds. Now my sister and I do the same in hers. It's never suggested, it just happens. These informal inspections have a meditative quality. They allow the gardener to keep an eye on things and learning to look properly is one of the most vital skills in gardening. Grandpa spent his last evening showing his closest friend around the garden, which had just come into the sort of lush growth that accompanies a warm mid-May. We were told that upon admiring it, he contentedly concluded that he could go now and a few hours later, age 97, he did. That's lovely. It's not a bad way to go, we've always said. Not heard. a bad way, not <laughs> a bad way, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> My great grandmother went after having made a grand slam in Bridge. Really? <laughs> yeah. Heroic. <laughs> Heroic. <laughs> um, I think your grandpa, one of your grandpas, had a quite rough and ready kind of approach to gardening as I remember it. And um, well, I feel you have a, a lovely enabling approach to gardening. I think you're probably not a fusser, but, and I think you also share your learning really clearly in your writing. Thank you. And uh, you say in Rootbound that knowledge often accumulates like dust so that you don't really realize you're accruing it. When well, no, dust definitely accumulates in my house. But, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure about knowledge, but uh, it's a lovely idea that you know more than you think you do. Um, and, and you talk also about people sometimes being put off gardening by an assumption of knowledge and a certain pernicketiness. I, that struck me, that phrase. And I, I must say, I'm often struck myself by how anxious and nervous and sometimes a bit ashamed people are about their perceived lack of prowess at gardening. Mm -hmm. um, they say they've got the opposite of a green thumb and they talk about how they always kill plants. Um, and, and, I wonder, I, I always try to encourage people, but I wonder if, do you have a view on how best to encourage people to get into gardening and, and have a go and not be too nervous? It's so funny that you say that because the first few years of my gardening were completely fueled by that. As much as I, as much as I loved how it made me feel and I loved the kind of rampant discovery of things and I loved watching things grow, part of the reason why I kept it so secret and for a long time, like the reason Nauticulture is called Nauticulture is because I didn't want to put my name to it. It was this kind of separate secret documenting of something. Um, and weirdly tonight, the, I've got an uncanny memory for dates and it was on the 8th of December in 2015 that I first came up with the concept of Nauticulture. So it's a small, a small birthday, but um, I kept it secret because of those feelings, those feelings of shame, those feelings of, oh, well, it, you know, I don't know enough. And much as I loved going to the community garden, I found such release and comfort and community there. It was really daunting to, part of the reason it took me so long to find a, a garden to volunteer with was because I was terrified of turning up with very little knowledge and being like, how can I be helpful? Um, is that background noise me or? I'm just checking. I've got, I've got the person. That's fine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I think it's a really legitimate fear. And I think not that you are dismissing it. I don't think it is to be dismissed. And I think it speaks to a number of things. I think it speaks to that people expect that, you know, there's a certain level of accomplishment and dare I say it, perfectionism associated with doing anything in your life. Um, especially I think among maybe our generation where we've had to be so good to do so many things in relatively trying conditions. Um, and that the, the luxury of just dabbling isn't, 
isn't that easily found. But I also think that because gardening isn't taught in schools, because kind of we grew up very much focused on indoor pursuits and digital technology and the internet, um, that we, we, we legitimately don't have that knowledge. And so it seems like a complete other world. And, and so if you start to kind of have a probe and a look into gardening literature, it's changing a lot in the last decade. But when I first started to look at everything was Latin names, you crack open a book and all it talks about is soil and compost. And if you don't even have a, guard, a, a flower bed, that's incredibly intimidating. So to answer your question is how do we make it more accessible? Well, for one, you, I think you're kind of getting getting people to the space is half the challenge. And, and funnily, I think actually 2020 has been quite a remarkable year for that as well. You will have seen in far greater practical terms than I will have managing volunteer numbers at the garden. But we've suddenly woken up and, and all of our kind of, for a long time, I would have conversations with people in the horticulture industry of like how, millennials are really into house plants. How do we capture that fascination and take them outdoors? How do we make them outdoor gardeners as well? And I think 2020 was the year that showed us we really need to tend the soil. And once you, once people capture that need, you know that the rest follows and you realize it's not a place to perform. Um, it's not a place where knowledge matters or doesn't matter. And it's a place of great generosity and learning if you're fortunate. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think that that's, that is fascinating. And I think it might be a really lovely time to share um, the bit where you around now actually five years ago where you got thrust a whole load of late bulbs to plant yes <laughs> rather brutally I think when you came well, you to know, the greenhouses <laughs> yeah well, Kat, Kat did that and she kind of rustled up this box and was like <laughs> it was the middle I mean it was the middle of January and I and for me it was such a brilliant lesson because I came back to the gardens obviously weeks after that consistently and I saw all of those tulips flower and um, it, it just showed me how you can rip up the rule book like no one would have said plant plant bulbs in January and evidently it worked so yes I will read this um, some of the bulbs were already sprouting keen to get on with a flower that was yet to be rooted in the ground I set two using fork to test the soil for hidden lumps of concrete and then digging shallow troughs under trees and along borders. After trying to squeeze half a dozen bulbs at a time into one container, the freedom of scattering a couple of hundred around felt ridiculously opulent, like throwing confetti into a duck pond. I nudged the cold earth back over the bulbs, which I placed with flat bottoms and small roots against the earth and pointy bits up, tapped down and drenched them with the hose. My movements were compromised by the two pairs of gloves, one woolen, another borrowed. Have <laughs> we got another, another person joining in? <laughs> um, one woolen, another borrowed and specifically for gardening, and the condensating drip of my nose, signs of a person too used to being indoors. The head gardener's hands were bare and fine, plonked into the icy water butt to rinse off at tea time. I'd always seen bulbs as something alchemical, brown and crispy onion shaped things. Their tracing paper skins can inflame hands and yet be so delicate as to be left discarded in the bottom of the paper bags they arrive in. But no bother, they do not need this most translucent of coverings for they hold petals and stamen and pollen and joy inside a dull handful of promise. Some such as croci, croci muscari, galanthus and dwarf iris are tiny little things more like individual garlic cloves than the sum of eight of them clutched in a ring. But then there are the great big lumbering ones, the alliums, the tulips, the amaryllis. There's the maths of it too. I garden like I cook, by taste and touch and smell and sound, barely measuring anything and trusting my gut. I learned to cook under the guidance of my mother who had always had butter and bacon in the fridge and an icy pantry full of things to summon a meal on an ancient recalcitrant agar where temperatures would change with the weather. Recipes often confound me. I wind up ignoring them and making something else happen instead. And so it is with gardening. One can be precise and the rule abiding masters of beautifully formal gardens will be, but I will never create a garden like that. For I am an inherently clumsy person, one happier when a little messy. And so I follow the rough geometry of gardening logic, 
that you plant bulbs at the depth of three times their height and in a cramped container garden as close together as they can be without touching because if it one is diseased the rest can be contaminated without that barrier of soil. That's a great example I think of, of the way you managed to mix the practical and the poetic um, which I think is really lovely and thank you for that. Um, it also just absolutely brings, I could just envisage you up there at the greenhouses as well. And I'll be doing that actually tomorrow. I'll be planting a whole load of lay bulbs as well with people um, and, and not be too terrified of the fact that we've missed Lord Mayor's Day, which is mid-November when you're meant to have got all the tulips. Mine always go late. <laughs> Mine always go late. It's fine. The it's soil's fine. warm enough in London, I feel. Yeah. So... So getting your hands in the soil, you've talked about that being maybe 2020, maybe being one of the, the years where people were a bit liberated uh, or maybe hardly liberated, but began to engage maybe more in the outdoors. Um, but we've certainly all been outdoors a lot more than we would have been, whether we actually had our hands in the soil. But I, I also feel that actually many of us, I've read a lot and I felt people talking that they were kind of comforted during COVID perhaps by nature's resilience. Yeah. just the way plants and animals just keep doing their thing even while we're all us humans appear to be in such a horrendous muddle mm. um and I'm sure you can put that much better than I can um and I'd love there's a short reading where you talk about some lovely fat poppy heads coming up and comforting you when you're you're really in a in a vulnerable state I think pit of pit of sorrow yeah <laughs> Sorry, okay. Lovering mess. Yeah, <laughs> something along those lines. So um, for those who haven't read the book, the kind of the catalyst for everything is, is an, uh, my then partner, who I thought I would spend the rest of my life with, uh, just essentially walking out. Um, so this is four days afterwards. On the fourth afternoon, there was an awakening. I came home to find the grey, rain-slicked floor of the balcony interrupted by a dash of the new. Two fat, furry poppy heads had opened outwards, leaving petals as crisp, perfect and white as laundered linen. I inhaled sharply. They were such a surprise, defiantly gleaming against the surrounded bloom. Even buds I've been keenly watching for weeks, in the case of some months, take me aback when they actually do bloom. It's almost like it happens in silence, when backs are turned or minds distracted. Not that I had been watching. In the days that had passed, I hadn't kept an eye on what was growing, on which buds were swelling or which flowers going over. The magnitude of my upset, the swirling confusion of Josh's departure had seen me grasp for meanings in my rattling thoughts. I tried to impose order on impossible things, make sense of the unexpected. But here was something little, smaller than my palm, and unpredictable, and yet so right. It made me realize that the plants didn't care. They didn't care if I was in love or out of it. They didn't care that I had stopped tending to them because I felt broken, or that I had initially started because I sought to nurture something to feel settled, to fix something I'd never even realized needed fixing. My state of being was entirely absent to them. Of course it was, they're not sentient beings, not contemporary human understanding at least. And regardless of what had happened between Josh and me, of what people said or did to one another, the plants would continue to grow and bloom and go to seed and die back and grow again, because that is what they exist to do. Yeah, when I, when I read that patch of the book, I, that account of the poppies, it took me right to a moment during I think May during lockdown where uh, I, some people might have noticed this, there were some incredible red poppies just had germinated and grown into this massive bunch in the lower greenhouse where, which had been completely renovated. So there was nothing growing in there at all. And just then these bright red poppies came out, which were against the newly whitewashed wall. And they just, they just looked extraordinary and, and people admired them so much, absolutely unintentionally there. Um, amazing. Was beautiful. Uh, so uh, plants do their own thing and it, it takes it takes us on in a way to a lovely history that you uncover um, of urban plants, um, some of which probably both of which people are very familiar with but 
but people probably don't know their, some people at least won't know the history of Budlier and, and Rose Bay Willow Herb, which are, are just um, incredible survivors um, and have really quite an interesting history. And, and this takes us more into the sort of really great historical aspects, some of the historical aspects of, of root bound. Yeah, so I, um, so the, it's funny because the, um, the Budlier story, in fact, both of those plants collide together in, in the August chapter of the book. So the book is split into 12 chapters, one each has its own month. Um, and I originally started looking at Budlia because it was, a, it was a plant that was very strongly tied to my childhood. And it was a plant that my sister in her new garden really wanted to grow. And that struck me as slightly into amusing, gently amusing, because Budlia, it seems more reviled than loved by a lot of people. But for me, it, it was a plant that's inherently entwined with um, train journeys around South London because between July and August and, and even late into September. I mean, even if you wandered around certain bits of town now, you'd still see those like skeletons of Budlia. There's one just around the corner from my house. Um, they, they, there is a love affair, is, is my understanding of it, between, between Budlia and railway stations. And this is because a bit like Rose Bay Willow Herb, it was a plant brought over from or Budlia was brought over from China by the Victorians and uh, populated in Victorian gardens in the late 19th century. And it had some modest success in gardens there, they grew it. But the, the reason why it's so, prof like, so everywhere now is because when London was blitzed, the mortar, the lime mortar from the cement that held the bricks together, or the mortar that held the bricks together, proved the, the perfect breeding ground for Budlia to settle in. And Budlia is kind of one of those plants that is, is fearsomely good at, at making, it's at kind of settling in and growing. So it's got a very shallow root uh, system. It can put down roots quite easily. It, it has thousands of seeds in each, in each of those kind of trumpety, nozzly flower heads. And then of course the railways just helped that along because with every hot gust of air that comes through a tunnel by a train, it just disperses all of those seeds, which is why they grow on the railways. And Denmark Hill was my station at the time. And there was this amazing one that would kind of grow in, in the tiniest crack of a root, which was probably some handyman's problem every year, but I loved it. I got, I've, I still love the fact that they just grow wherever they don't want to and people don't want them to and that's that resilience was incredibly powerful and Rose Bay Willow Herb similar story um, in America they've got slightly more respect for it um, they call it fireweed over here during the war it, it, it was so spread by the blitz that it became known as bombweed um, but in America they grow it after forest fires because it's one of the few things that will and the resultant root system pulls the soil back together so that new things can grow, um, which is also something I found very beautiful that, you know, the, these kind of reviled, often called invasive weed-like plants actually do so much good for our ecosystems. That's really fascinating. I, I think it's, I, I love, I love the way you appreciate cities. Um, you know, it's not a book, your book is not one, and I suspect suspect you're not either um full of yearning for the countryside it's it's a book <laughs> about it's a, you know you're excited by cities yeah. and you know you have some lovely accounts of of glastonbury's um hills and woods um seeming a bit more appealing than the festival itself but in the main this is a book that celebrates green spaces in cities yeah um and i really love this um and i also found your exploration of of the history of parks in cities really fascinating. Um, you talk about Newcastle and obviously a lot about London as well. Um, and and yeah, could you just talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so parks have um, a deeply political and um, a deeply political history and a deeply, um, a history of deep protest in, and petitioning like and people history. So parks existed, parks were another Victorian invention. A lot of our horticultural history was, was kind of happened over the Victorian era, I think in part because 
it was it was kind of, it was also an era of huge industrialization and and so this is kind of the yang to the yin of that so to speak um but in short you know london in the eighth i think the first part it was either the 1840s or the 1860s should know that but basically it came at a time when people were work, the working class were they had one day off a week it was a sunday they spent the rest of the time living in squalor or very difficult cramped housing um they didn't have gardens they weren't able to access um green space and that, there was one point in the middle of the 19th century where if a man who worked in whitechapel he'd have to walk six miles in order to access the next available bit of green land and on their one day off a week the working men wanted to see green space so there were these huge petitions they went to they went to Westminster they went to Parliament and there were the you know William Wilberforce was one of the great campaigners um, and they came up with this concept of green lungs and this was at a time when um, there were all sorts of unpleasant infectious diseases going around cholera was going around before they knew that cholera came from the water they thought it carried in the air and there was this real sense that we needed to greenify our cities by making more public spaces. It's not unlike a conversation that's been happening in the wake of the lockdown, the pandemic with reports and studies showing how few people are further than um, five minutes walk from a green space that they can freely go to. Um, and so, uh, you know, people signed the petitions in their thousands and Newcastle was among the first, one of the first parks. There was an arboretum in Derby that opened uh, first, and I think Battersea was shortly afterwards, and there was kind of flurry of parks in London, Victoria Park, Brockwell Park followed uh, a little later on, but yeah, Newcastle Lees's Park was in uh, the 1860s, and this, I grew up in the country, in the countryside, you don't have parks because you live in the countryside, so when I moved to Newcastle, the first city I lived in as a student when I was 19, I encountered Lees's Park, this kind of classic Victorian boating lake, bandstand, iron railings. And to me, it was such a thing of beauty. It was open 24 seven. Um, I would walk through it at 4 a.m. after going clubbing and I'd listen to the birds sing. I, 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 was ju I just thought it was so magical and I still think parks are magical. And there's a bit in the book where I, I say that I feel like I've done most of my growing up in parks. Like the key important moments of my life have largely happened in parks um, and they mean a great deal to me. Hmm. Yeah, I think the, the green lungs um, and, and the movements to create, you know, national, national um, parks in recognizing the significance, national parks and cities is, is very contemporary and relevant. And it is really striking how 21st century is, is in some ways repeating some of the arguments of, of the 19th century. Um, yeah. And, and uh, I think, obviously, being in South London, you being in South London, um, it is kind of thrilling, actually, getting the record, get, reading a book and finding you describing Brockwell Park and, and giving the history of Brockwell Park um, in it. And then, of course, arriving at the greenhouses as well is, is really, really fun. Um, we did, and really very interesting, we did talk about you reading another passage um, potentially from when you first came to the greenhouses, and yeah. um, and I think that that would be that would be interesting. Do you have the page number because it hasn't. I haven't done the the orange sticker effort. I think it's in it's in October though, isn't it? I could probably yeah, find. Yeah, I think if you go to uh, two five three. Two five three. Um, there's a nice bit. There. I did actually do this. Yes, yes. Uh, oh no, two five, two five three. Yeah, great, great, great. Sorry, everyone. I, Kate's very and actually I did. It's got a little BPCG tag on it. Um, Kate's very lucky because normally I I hate reading at events and um, would pretty much outright refuse to do more than about a page. So uh, it's a testament to the love for. Um, for the greenhouses but yeah so this this was after i'd been volunteering for a few weeks and and um a few months even and the parks uh, the greenhouses have really become like an essential place for me 
One morning, I took my bad temper out into the cool, grubby air of Brixton and pounded the pavement until I reached Brockwell Park, my rubber-soled walking boots feeling odd within the sea of late morning commuters. I was destined for the community greenhouses. In those red brick walls, I had found a sanctuary, a hidden place of industry and calm where little mattered apart from the job in hand. There was process here, physical and seasonal progress that combined logic, instruction, science and luck with time in the hope that something beautiful and orderly could be made from the dirt and the havoc of nature. I was one of the very smallest parts of it, hardly a regular volunteer, nor one with much knowledge. And I liked that. I liked being unintegral, a tiny contribution to a plot few knew about or understood, giving my time and energies to the land in an attempt to make it better. This was a time of year where gardening is more labour than nurture, especially in a large place where new projects are going on all the time. That morning, the two of us were given spades and wheelbarrows and tasked with levelling a patch of lump and earth so an outdoor play kitchen could be built there for children who visited the gardens. Not a glamorous activity, but satisfying in its simplicity and purpose. Like much of London, the community gardens have clay heavy soil. The overnight frost had helped us. When temperatures rise above freezing, the moisture in the soil thaws, causing the clay to soften and clod together, putting up a gluey resistance for the blade that tries to remove it. But the earth was cold and solid. We could loosen it with the spears of a fork before shoveling it up with a flat heft of the spade. My body was still clumsy with these tools. I could bend and lift and push with vigour, but I knocked my shins on the wheelbarrow. The pads of my fingers protested through the rough wooden ha handle in the cold. Do you want me to go on about the... I think that's, I mean, I would love you to go on. <laughs> but I'm also aware, there's just such a lot, and I'm also aware that I'm making you read and work very hard. <laughs> Fine. Fine. Just making you dig the soil all over again, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, but... Um, we had lovely conversations that day um, yes. and, and uh, it's very enjoyable to have them again now. Um, and, you know, the book takes us through the history of Sexby and who was the, um, the LCC employee, I believe, who designed um, the walled garden in Brockwell Park and, and other walled gardens in South London as well. And um, and talks a lot about bl the Blades family as well, the glass manufacturer. So all of this is, is great South London history and there's more. So read the book and, and I'm not going to make Alice read the whole thing. But, um, but it's not only South London. What, I, what is great fun is that you travel to other cities, to Amsterdam, to Paris, to New York and to Berlin. And, and there are many stories in there. And a really fascinating one about someone who I didn't know about, I probably should have done, is Liz Christie. Oh, to, yeah, which I found really fascinating. And also, you, it'd be lovely if you talked about a little bit about Liz Christie. Um, and then we can maybe move on to talk about some of your 19th century women as well. I, you know what? I don't know how nobody has made a film about Liz Christie because she looked like she looked like a film star. She had these incredible cheekbones and she always wore like glamorous scarves and incredible jewelry. She just looked amazing. You know, sometimes you see those women gardeners in amazing workwear looking very glamorous and also very hard working. She was one of those and she was incredible. And um, her time in New York was number one, incredibly short. She died at age 39. She had cancer, which is just brutally sad um, and, and a real testament to what she achieved. But, you know, 1970s New York, like, we're talking a lot of heroin addiction, we're talking a lot of crime, like New York was not the glamorous, it, the 80s hadn't happened, it was still a really down at heel, dangerous place. And, um, and Liz Christie was an artist and uh, she noticed one day she was walking around one of the many empty deserted plots in Manhattan, Lower East Side. And um, she, was no she noticed that tomato plants had grown there and she, and, and she deduced that the tomato plants were um, a product of the, the garbage or rubbish and the tomatoes that had rotted down and, and set seed. And this inspired her um, to see these plots that had been totally disregarded by anyone in the city as, for, as places where things could grow. And so they start, you know, she basically went on a guerrilla gardeners movement for kind of the most prominent one in New York 
and they started by making seed bombs and they would literally like throw these over the gates of these abandoned lots and eventually they start they they broke into a plot in uh, the Lower East Side and started to garden it. Um, and she formed a community garden there. And she and it's still there. It's on the so I lived in New York for a bit. Um, it's kind of blink and you miss it. And it's on the edge of um, a big dual carriageway called Houston, which is like north of House. It's how you get Soho in New York, south of Houston. Um, and um, and she formed that garden, which is beautiful and tiny, but she also sparked a movement across the city of turn of making these small community gardens in the middle of built up parts of New York where no, nothing else was happening. Um, and I think by the end, I'd have to check, but I think by the end she kind of, she managed to have more than 200 plots. She left this legacy of more than 200 small community gardens in Manhattan by the time she died. And, you know, she, she became a real advocate. She kind of took over pirate radio talking about the benefits of gardening. Um, she was a total rock star, total rock star. So a real pioneer then. Yeah. And yeah. Also as well, which like, let's be real, like doing these things, the, the kind of stuff she was up against, a lot of construction people, a lot of city people in, in, a, in a more chauvinistic time, it's not to be knocked. Well, this is why I loved the, I love these kind of these sort of rogue females, really, that um, <laughs> that, that, that crop up, you know, um, in, in the book. And you talk about a lot about these kind of wonderful uh, Victorian and enthous plant enthusiasts. Um, and I think Marion North is probably quite well, well known. I mean, she has her, her, her little gallery, doesn't she, at Kew? Is that, yeah. Is, yeah. But, um, but she just, I mean, incredible. She traveled all over India and Brazil. Um, she described marriage as a terrible experiment, which turned <laughs> women into a sort of upper servant. Um, and then there's Ellen Wilmot, who people probably may have heard about because of she pops up as a, a lot of plants are named after her, particularly sea holly seeds, which I learned from, from Root Band. She would keep in her pocket um, and, and scatter whenever she could. So that the, the plant is now known as Miss Wilmot's ghost. Uh, so she, there she was, another another sort of female feminist, perhaps guerrilla gardener. Um, and then we in Rootbound, look look at me taking ownership. We, <laughs> you explore um, the fern hunters, the yeah. female fern hunters, and and teratomania, um, which I must say was one of my my favourite bits of the book. Um, one of mine, yeah. They are amazing. It's funny. So the teratomaniacs. Um, or the fern hunters, they crept into a very early version of the book, like one of the, the kind of the very baby version of the book that I would go and meet editors with um, when we when it hadn't got a deal and and um, and they always they always fascinate people um, and what they were essentially were young Victorian women, um, often teenagers who were completely obsessed with ferns. And, and um, it's a concept that I, I actually, I write quite a length about it in the book because it is, it's almost too good to be true. And it's a beautiful mix of completely ridiculous, but also deeply admirable. And I continue to sit on the fence as to whether thinking it was somewhat hysterical, which is such a gendered word, but it's slightly, yeah completely out of control and also seeing it as something deeply inherently freeing and, and a real kind of rebellion so to break it down essentially it kind of lasted from the first inklings of it began in the 1830s it sort of hit its stride in the 1860s and it died out pretty much by um you know a few decades after that it lasted a long time it was a big deal it was written about in color supplements there was a publishing boon on fern collecting books. Um, it, the, the main activity was to go out and hunt or collect rare ferns from the British countryside and then bring them home. And some people would keep them in kind of terrariums called Wardian cases, which were very expensive. They were the equivalent of about 300 pounds today's money um, in, in their kind of quite hot, stuffy, coal-fumed Victorian living rooms. You'd have these sweating ferns. Um, if you go up to Hampstead and walk out of the, the Heath, 
um, in the kind of the really Keatsian bit of Hampstead, there is a, I always point it out to my partner and he never cares, but there is a tiny little greenhouse between two chimneys on one of the roofs there. And they built these Wardian cases all over. You'd quite ha often have them hanging off window boxes. They had them on their roofs. That's one of the last remaining ones is up in Hampstead. Um, because they were completely obsessed with looking after these rare ferns that they found. And the reason why it interested me is one, because it was a hobby uh, enjoyed by young women, which is always interesting because I feel like whether that's One Direction or Instagram or fern hunting, if you're a young woman enjoying something, the general consensus will be to ridicule it um, rather than take it fairly seriously. It's like Bay City Roller itis. It's easier to dismiss the interests of young women than take them seriously. Um, and then the other reason is that I saw so many parallels between Terradomania and the contemporary houseplant fascination that we've been witnessing over the past 10 years. Um, and I realised I am talking about this while surrounded by houseplants and a fern, but, um, but yeah, and, and, you know, to the extent that these days people will pose under palms in on holiday and put it on their Instagram. Well, Victor young Victorian women would sit on top of tree ferns in New Zealand, have their photograph taken, put it in an album. They would go on, they were like Thomas Cook started out, the holiday company started out by selling fern based trips, like tours. Like there are so many bits of it. They would embroider ferns on their cushions. It would be on their crockery. It would be on their clothes. The same way that botanical prints have had a huge proliferation in interiors in the past 10 years. And there are just so many parallels. And what it boils down to, I think, is, is a hungering for the outside. Like the Victorian times were incredibly, you know, as I said, huge period of industrialization. People weren't getting outside much. Women had a really limited life, but here they were, they were allowed to go out in their special fern hunting clothes because there were special fern hunting clothes and roam the countryside. And it must've been a really freeing thing to do. That's so interesting. Um, I, I, I think you do, you do have an ambivalence about it though, I think. I yeah. mean, um, and, I, and I think, I think that's fine. <laughs> I don't think well, you have to, you can continue to sit on the fence about it actually. I do, because the thing is like, they, don't give me, like there was a lot of waste. Like, you know, even these, there's someone called um, Nona Bellas, who, whose book I tracked down and quote, who was like this kind of, Lady Fern Hunter who documented her journeys. And even she admits that she would like rip these things out of the countryside and then let them die by the time she got back home. And it was really bad for our biodiversity. It was very much caught up in itself. Somewhere along the line, the associations that came with, with the appreciation of, of them, of the ferns kind of totally got lost in, in, the, in the frenzy of it all. The same way that uh, you will see sad succulents crammed in pots and spray painted with gold in Sainsbury's. Like that isn't the end result of the houseplant boom that's connected so many of us with nature. So yeah, much as I kind of find it marvelous as in it is a marvel, I don't necessarily approve of it. Yeah, I think there's always a fascination about collectors, isn't there? Collectors and obsessive collecting. Um, it's both fascinating and also, well, apart from the kind of eco-destruction that it could, it can, there's also something slightly, slightly, as you say, obsessional and manic about it as well. Um, and where that comes from is, is very fascinating. Um, and I think that in a way is one of the really, the things I found very fascinating as well was your kind of approach to millennial, your weariness in a way in mm -hmm. describing millennial, the millennial, millennials experience that there's a, there's a sort of weary tone in the book about mm -hmm the hecticness of millennials life and their kind of compulsive striving for experience and for broadcasting that experience mm. in a way that their lack of, of root boundness. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, sorry, have you finished? Our, uh, well, no, sorry. <laughs> All to say was that I also feel, I did also feel that you're also quite weary of people criticizing that your generation as well. Um, yeah. We are, I mean, you know, there are so many books that deal with this better than I do. The one I think of is, uh, I'm gonna grab it because it's right here. Uh, Gia Tolentino's Trick Mirror, which is like the ultimate. It came out last summer and it's very much um, a book of essays about a life lived online. And, and it, it and, and 
I think kind of what what both are nudging at is the fact that we are both we are millennials do frustrating stupid things like document their whole lives on the internet of which I fully put my hands up and, and I, I participate in but it's also a product of the kind of late capitalist world that we are in in that our value that in my case mine as a writer as a journalist um, is inherently tied to what we publish on the internet and the brands that we we exist as and and that added to the sense of uh, encountering what is it two huge recessions before we're 40 um the fact that we a lot of us were lumped with um massive university debts um that university places were incredibly competitive um that you know there's there's never when i read biographies of people who are of older generations than me i feel like we never had the 20s where you didn't really need to know what you were doing yet we always had to know and if we didn't know it was expected that we would and we were getting there and um and i think that is we as a result we're often seen as we're whining i feel like i'm whining now but also we are complicit to a certain extent in that creation and upholding that because we you know you look at gen z and it really feels like they're ripping up things and they're making a change and they're stopping bad things from happening to a certain extent and we didn't do that we went along with it so it's a complicated thing um it's a complicated thing and, and depending on who you are you either find that bit of the book incredibly annoying or you find it quite revelatory judging by the reviews i've read anyway <laughs> Well, I definitely didn't find it annoying. I, I, I was going to ask you a slightly mean kind of question, really, at yeah. the end of um, as we're coming to an end. And I'm sure people have got loads of questions they want to ask. So I sort of hogged you quite a lot. And in a way, you've come onto it anyway. Sort of just I was going to ask you in a way I find it fascinating that you've managed to create a, something of a hybrid career um, mm -hmm. as a journalist, a writer, a publisher and a gardener. Yeah. And. You know, this generation coming out of COVID, I mean, uh, but they may be ripping things up, but they're facing a pretty hard time, I think. Yeah, and I just you. wondered if you had any sort of advice for, for people who are trying to forge careers in these pretty tricky, tricky times. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good one. I don't want to be that, you know, as someone who's been a journalist um, and until this year um, worked, really quite hamster wheel lifestyle in a newsroom until I moved into publishing um, where people work in a normal fashion um, I, you know you, you get told throughout that career of older people being like oh don't do this blah 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 and, and I wouldn't say that um, I think it is difficult um, I, w I also feel like too old even to advise people on what it's even like to graduate at the moment to consider your career prospects like for me that's 10 15 years ago like I didn't I moved to London without a smartphone like that would be unthinkable now um but I I do also think that what my generation played with which was that you can kind of work it out for yourself and be bold enough to give something a go even if you don't really feel qualified you can watch a youtube video you can learn how to do it you can stick it on the internet which is essentially a potted history of my gardening career um you can i think i think the generation coming up are kind of already ahead of that and you know i don't think greta thunberg sat there like racked with imposter syndrome about becoming a climate change activist like i think she just did it um and yeah as you say i have a hybrid career Believe me, I would love to just be a writer. I would love to just write books. It would be amazing. Um, but the lifestyle I keep doesn't allow that to be the case. Um, but with advice, I, I, don't, I can't remember the last time I spoke to a teenager, Kate, so I wouldn't even want to mm. <laughs> feel like I have something to give them. I'd, 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 ra I'd rather learn what it's like for them first because I don't think I know enough yeah, well, you, you, that's a, that's a lovely um, reluctance to preach, which which I think is admirable. And and I think yeah, I think the confidence to try things out uh, and to get out there must be something an enviable quality that this generation does have. Um, and and I, I hope I hope they can own it. 
Um, but um, it's been really, really enjoyable um, oh, hearing you. you read and talk. Um, and I, I feel I have, yeah, somewhat thrust, thrust a spade and a cold piece of ground in front of you and made you, you work very hard, but it's been absolutely delightful. Thank you very, very much, Alice. Thank you. Um, just to say again to um, everyone, you haven't, I haven't at least seen questions up, written up, but um, it would be lovely to hand over to, to the audience now, um, to all of you to ask Alice questions. And, and just, just before I do, um, just to say, Rootbound is now out in paperback, isn't it? Is that it's right? On Christmas Eve. Oh, but, Christmas Eve. Yeah, but I wouldn't be surprised if it starts appearing in shops fairly soon. Sometimes you can get them a few weeks in advance. You can certainly pre-order it um, yeah. if you want a paperback version. And you can pre-order from bookshop.org, which supports independent bookshops. And, yeah. and as I said, from Dulwich Books at 6 Croxted Road, which is open. Um, the perfect Christmas present. Um, so, yeah, please, please, everybody, um, do ask Alice, do ask Alice questions. And while, while people are, yeah, Amy, great. Oh, can I ask a question? Hi, Alice, thank you so much for talking to everybody today. I mean, your book actually got me to Brockwell and through reading your, um, your writing about it inspired me to kind of check it out. And um, it's definitely been a big part of my life this year that I've really appreciated. Um, I wanted to ask about how you, we've seen how on your Nauticulture um, Instagram and also how you talk in the book, how you've moved from um, your parents' garden to balconies. And now that we've seen you've moved from community to your own garden and your own soil. Um, and I wondered if there's anything that you have taken from your experience with balcony gardening, from community gardening, from gardening in somebody else's garden, to having your own space um, mm. with soil and being able to garden on your own terms in a, you know, with some land, I suppose. Yeah. Oh, well, it, the main thing is, is an enormous sense of um, luck and privilege and gratitude it still doesn't really feel real I was writing a piece the other day uh for a paper and and I, I can't remember quite what I wrote but something along the lines of kind of I stare at the garden expecting things from it and, and it kind of I feel like it's just telling me to be patient we're still we're still at a really early stage of our relationship together I feel like we're still really getting to know each other it's only been a four months um, I didn't really garden much my parents' garden at all. So um, not m the, the main thing I would take from that is that I want to grow some of the, weirdly, the things I want to grow, my parents grew. So I really want to grow sweet peas, for instance, which is something that my mother always had right outside the back door. Um, from community gardening, as I said, I cannot plant a tulip without thinking of cat foisting a box of tulips on me. But um, also just... I mean, I find like, Brockwell is such an amazing space from, it's so, so very inspirational from a kind of organic perspective. Um, I think there's a lot to be gained there. I still walk in the, in the gardens and the park a lot. Um, and from balcony and from balcony gardening, wow, like I will never not, I feel like I've always got a big part of me loves container gardening. And the first bit of the garden that I kind of got sorted was outside the back door, all in containers. Um, I love container gardening. So that's not going anywhere particularly quickly, but I'm still learning, it's all so new. And, and uh, I also don't feel that just because I've got my own garden that I've turned my back on community gardening, um, I keep trying to get down there and li life is busy, but I, I do think there's so much to be learned. I mean, I don't have a pond, I don't have glass houses. So there's so much to be gained from working in that space, I'd say. Kate, you might talk. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> might something. If anybody's feeling shy, though, do do um, do feel free just to put your question up in on the chat. Um, Alice, yes, can I, Liz, Day, can I follow up on that question? Um, yeah, my question cool. in the chat was, can you tell us a bit about the garden you've created now? And yeah. I understand that it's completely new. But could you just yeah. sort of say what it is you've seen in the garden? Yeah, that you've just suddenly become uh, got to know. That yeah. you are excited by um i'm excited by i'm excited by the brick wall at the back which i've been excited by since i first saw it which is it's a north facing garden which means that all of the light hits the brick wall at the back and so i'm really excited about that um 
at the moment, it, it really was a blank slate. Um, there, the work that had been done there was very easy to undo. And with the exception of a very beautiful salvia, I basically ripped out everything that had been put in. Um, and I plan to rip out more hard landscaping when time and funds allow. But uh, you know what? It really is a state of getting acquainted. I sit all day and I look out at it uh, working and I just watch the sun go past, like literally hour by hour. It's like a giant sundial. And I have put quite a few perennials in there. I've dug new beds. I've covered the whole thing in 750 litres of manure I logged through the house. Um, but it's it's waiting time. My partner doesn't garden. And the other day he was looking out the kitchen. He was like, when will the garden grow? And I'm like, that's a very good question. <laughs> it's like, it's growing all the time. <laughs> but it looks, it looks quite fair out there. And I'm really, um, I've put so much into the soil that I, your guess is as good as mine. I have a very strong visual image of what it might look like. And I know it won't really look anything like that when it happens. Yeah. Well, I think, I think mulching, mulching and soil conditioning is just the ticket right now. <laughs> Hope so. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just reading the chat and Lizzie, that's, yes. um, that's very, very sweet. And um, I'm really, I'm sorry you've had a difficult time, but um, it's, uh, yeah, I'm glad that, that gardening is doing that for you as well. And thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate it. Um, and also to, to Mimi as well. Wow. Um, and, <laughs> and I hope How to Grow Stuff helps. I can definitely recommend some better beginner gardening books for what it's worth. It's, <laughs> it's perfunctory at best, but um, thank you for joining us and for sharing your thoughts. Um, and um, yes, Heather. Heather, don't, I, I wish you'd had the courage to inquire about the community gardens. I, I hope you don't need courage to inquire about the community gardens. We, we, um, anybody is welcome, certainly welcome to visit, even, even through lockdown, everybody has just been coming at weekends. Um, and uh, and we've, we've been able to accommodate an awful lot of volunteers, though at the moment, sadly, we've got a bit of a waiting list. Um, just because we do have to limit numbers. But, but once things get safer, um, I'm hoping we can have even more volunteers again. Um, I so. don't realize, Kate, quite how unusual Brockwell is in making yourself so open and so friendly in such a kind space because it is really, I remember being really, really scared. And if you, and, and because you had that wonderful, that wonderful thing right at the front where it's like, if you want to volunteer, email us, it is, a godsend because it, it feels quite daunting to go up to all these busy looking gardeners and say hello can I join in like it's it's really scary and I think actually Brockwell is brilliant for that but Heather I, I can hard relate um it is it can be a courageous thing to do but you should definitely do it as Kate says it's um, wonderful Heather do you still live in in South London oops No, I don't. I live in oh. Somerset now. Oh no! <laughs> I can't believe like reading your book, Alice. I was just like, I've been there. I've done that. I nearly did that. And um, yeah, that uh, existentially millennial stuff. And I was like, oh, that's what the words for that are. <laughs> it was just no. and definitely have the courage now and like permission to like take my gardening urges seriously, like even if I'm pretty bad at it. So thanks. You're very welcome. <laughs> How's Somerset treating you? I'm loving it. I feel like I've picked a great year to leave the city. Um, and I've been really lucky because I live with housemates here as well. So yeah, it's great. Lots of green. Yeah, I was there in October and it, it, I always forget quite how, how beautiful Somerset is. It's um, yeah. The summer was pretty magical. Yeah, good. Yeah. Glad to hear it. <laughs> Can I ask one more question? You may. Which is a bit a bit cheeky when I've been asking so many. <laughs> um, and we absolutely do not have to sit here till eight thirty, everybody. It was a generous time. We can, we can release everyone. I thought when I saw that you that it's scheduled until eight thirty, I was like, wow, that's ambitious. Yeah. <laughs>
That was Liz's, that was Liz's suggestion. <laughs> Liz, um, I just want to ask you how it feels writing a personal memoir. Mm. And if it feels kind of me personally, although I'm a blabber in talking, I cannot imagine writing about my life in a, in a such personal way yeah, yeah. Um, without feeling very kind of exposed and odd about it being in perma print. Yeah, um, so it's a really good question. I would say that now it's out there, I, it doesn't bother me at all. Writing it did feel like just existing without skin. Um, and, it, and it did feel really vulnerable. And one of the main editing notes that my editor and I worked over time and time again was that she was like, you're holding yourself back. We need more from you. So it was, it was not easy. Um, and uh, I think I was, yeah, the, I mean, I don't really mind strangers knowing about because what do they know, but like, they don't know who I am. I'm not famous, but um, I did, I did think a lot about the people who I did know when I was writing the book. And it's, you know, I, I speak to authors every day as my day job. And so often they'll say, well, now it's published, it's kind of done. It's like that chapter is closed. And that definitely uh, is the case with Rootbound. Like, I you know, events like this are incredibly humbling and I, and I love doing it. But the events of that book were nearly five years ago now. Um, and that chapter of my life has closed and it kind of exists in that book. And I'm like, okay, cool. And that's kind of why I don't like reading from it because it, when I finished writing a manuscript and I handed it in, it was all done and dusted. I went through what I now recognize as a kind of creative grief because you work on something for such a long time and you, it's only really you and that project you people get bored of you talking about it and you say you're a blabber I'm an intensely private person with my feelings like I don't talk about them much but then I, you know so for me doing the book was was weirdly cathartic and quite therapeutic in a way I didn't realize until afterwards so it served other purposes um, and now that it's out, it doesn't really bother me. But at the time, yeah, it makes you, it does feel very vulnerable. And it is quite a weird thing to go through. Yeah, <laughs> I can imagine. totally see why some people would be like, why are you doing this? <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. It's, um, I guess the time lag, I can, I can see that the time lag between writing, publishing and it being released. And then the continuing talking about it must be a help. That's a really fascinating and honest answer. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, it would be, be very interesting to hear what Sue Stewart Smith says about in response to the same question because she's our speaker in February, and of course she's her book is a lot about her personal journey as as well as the, her gardening. I was on the phone to her last week, um, and we were having a bit of a chat because obviously her book came out about six months or so after mine and has been phenomenally successful, and. Um, and we kind of had this, this sort of writerly chat writers tend to have, which is sort of like, oh, you're working on anything new, which is always a bit of a, a poison chalice because everyone's always working on something new, but it just depends on how you're feeling about it that day, whether you want to talk about it or not. And she was, she was saying, you know, she hasn't yet been able to, the, the interest in the World Garden Mind has been so phenomenal that she's not actually been able to carve any space from it yet. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm sure your event in February will be wild. She is brilliant and it's such a good book. Um, speaking of books, Joshua's asked about other books or resources. Um, do you mind if I take this one, Kate? I feel like I'm chairing. Please do. Okay. <laughs> um, novice Gardeners. There is a book that came out earlier this year called The Five Minute Gardener, or Five Minute Garden by Letitia McClough. Um, which has fast become one of those gardening books that I just keep by my bedside, which doesn't happen very often. Letitia is brilliant. She's super knowledgeable. Um, she's been around for a while. She released a book called Sweet Peas for Summer, which is a very good like first year gardening book, which is out of print. I, I want, in order to go and read it, I had to literally drive to her house to pick up a copy. It was uh, dedicated, but Five Minute Garden, will very, you can read it in a couple of hours and it, it tells you very succinctly all the things you need you need to do and, and very no nonsense. You know, her attitude to pruning roses is bend it the way you like it and chop it because if you sit down and read about it, you'll never get anything done. 
And that is the kind of, that's like exactly my attitude. I, I just love it. I'm like, thank you. I've been permission granted, but she's really knowledgeable. And, and you know, her advice of going out and weeding for five minutes every day is a very good way to, to keep on top of things in the garden. So I love that book that came out this year. Books that informed Rootbound, uh, We Built a Garden by Marjorie Fish, who is a brilliant writer or was a brilliant writer and had a horrible husband. Um, and, and for me, she was of interest because it was so apparent that once he died, she became a much better gardener because she was granted the freedom to be one. But We Built a Garden is a very beautiful, again, quite no nonsense, written in the, between the 30s and the 50s account of trying to create um, a large garden. I think in Somerset, Heather, might be relevant to you or Gloucestershire. Um, very much of its era, but I, I liked it a lot. Vita Sackville West, I feel like you could still pick up in your garden today and uh, and find a lot of use in it. Uh, Claire Ratinon has brought out a book called How to Grow Your Dinner Without Leaving the House. And it's like a much more uh, well-informed version of my first book, How to Grow Stuff. And it's all about vegetables. And she's such a beautiful grower, is Claire, and, and it's an amazing book. Um, and other ones, as, oh, the, the book, if you've got a small space, the book that really got me going on balcony gardening is The Balcony Gardener by Isabel Palmer. And uh, again, a lot of really good information in unfussy ways. Um, so though, yeah, those are my reliable ones. If you're a houseplant person, um, House of Plants and Root Nurture Grow are two, they're brilliant Christmas presents actually, because they look like coffee table books. They're so beautifully shot. They're very tastefully put together, but they are packed full of information and ideas. Is that enough? I feel like it's quite a lot. <laughs> that's fantastic. That's, that's a reading list and, and a present gift. That's perfect. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Really great. Okay, um, any, and that's a great question and, and a great answer. Uh, I think it might be time not to grow our vegetables, but to maybe go and eat some of them. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, so I'm just showing you the lovely book, yeah, Rootbound. <laughs> Such a beautiful cover. Who designed the cover? Uh, In-house at Canongate, who are my publishers, who I adore, but... It was designed by a lady called Raffaella Romara. Um, and she took the art from um, Leila Shawa, who, who did the, um, the cover, but the cover was totally different from how I was anticipating. And authors get much less of a say in their cover than, than people ever realize. Like basically, if you don't like it, tough. Um, and the publisher knows what they're doing when it comes to covers. So that's, that's the hardback and then this one's the paperback. Um, which is a kind of, you can see, you can see that they're siblings, but they haven't come out quite the same way. Yeah. So that, yeah, same thing. Uh, this was designed by Jill Healy, but people always remark on how beautiful they are, which I can take no credit for, but yeah. Why different for the paperback to the hardback? Um, marketing reasons. So they often try to they tend to learn from the hardback and work out who bought it or who didn't buy it and then try to have another go with the paperback because they know that people who didn't buy the hardback will probably want to buy the paperback and vice versa. So getting into publishing detail now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Alice. That's been an absolutely lovely evening. Really, really interesting. Um, great pleasure. And, and thank you to everyone in the audience who's come to it. Um, and, and listened well so quietly, but you were all muted, so you had no chance to do to be anything other than quiet. Um, we'd love to see you at the greenhouses. I know, um, I must come back. I've been staying you. away out of guilt of not volunteering, so. Oh God, don't, don't, God, guilt has no place at all, for heaven's sake, come and see us. Okay, I will. I <laughs> we're will. open, we're open right up to the 20th of December. Great. Um, and then we'll open again, I think on the 6th, the 6th or the 7th in January. Um, and what else to say? Yes, we have some more talks coming up. Um, Liz very um, elegantly mentioned that Sue Stewart-Smith is talking in the second, on the second Tuesday in February 
Um, Carolyn Steele is talking in January on her book, Cytopia, How Food Can Save the World. And then the second Tuesday in March, Joe Ferguson is going to talk to us about urban bat conservation. Um, so please do, do join us second Tuesdays of the month um, for panel. women in nature and wildlife. Um, thank you again, Alice. And, you, and now we have to do that awkward thing where we all wave. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, happy Christmas, everyone. Happy New Year. <laughs> okay. See you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Okay.